Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Danube Institute. And um, let me, uh, my name is John O'Sullivan, I'm the president of it. One or two people I recognize, but for those who are coming here for the first time, let me <coughs> just say a few brief words about our work. Um, we're a small, uh, but we think, uh, feisty uh, think tank. We are, um, uh, our, our positions are clear. We are conservative in matters of culture, and history, um, religion. We are in economics, classical liberals, and in foreign policy, we are Atlanticists. Uh, they're very clear positions. Uh, we hope to be a transmission belt between um, Central Europe, uh, Western Europe, between Central Europe and the Anglosphere, between Central Europe and other parts of the world. On this occasion, of course, the Middle East, which I think is the, only the second time we've really been dealing in a major way with Middle Eastern questions. Um, but we always like to have to ensure that if we have a strong point of view, we invite people who um, don't necessarily share that view and sometimes are opposed to it in order to facilitate debate uh, argument on the grounds that the more debate there is, the less, partner, the less partisanship there will be, certainly the less ignorant partisanship there will be. Um, we're very fortunate, <coughs> excuse me, on this occasion um, to have as our principal guest Professor Eitan Gilboa of the Israeli, uh, the Israeli Public Diplomacy Foundation, of which he is the, uh, the founder and uh, the director. Um, uh, you will have uh, a folder in which you can um, read uh, the, distinction, uh, the distinction of uh, Professor Gilboa's career. Uh, he's both an academic, he's a journalist, he served as an advisor to governments and, and uh, as a diplomatic advisor. So he covers the, uh, and he's a strategist, so he covers the waterfront, so to speak, of these difficult questions. Um, the Middle East, uh, I will leave it to you to read the full biography, um, but, but he is obviously someone whom, on this topic, we are very fortunate to have address us. Um, I, I'm not an expert on the Middle East, and I propose to conceal that by not saying a great deal about it. Uh, but I will say simply that uh, today it does appear as though there are one or two trends in the region which make it even more exciting than it usually is. And we have to confess, it's never dull. Um, one of those is the extraordinary reversal of alliances uh, and the new alliances that are emerging with them. Um, apparently Israel and Saudi Arabia and other sunny Arab states um, finding a common front against uh, Iran and the encroach, encroachment of Iran upon the Gulf and on the, the whole region. Um, secondly, there is the relationship between Israel um, and the um, uh, European Union, uh, which has its ups and downs, contrasting at times with the relationship between Israel and the United States. Uh, and finally, what you now have in the last year or so, although it was foreshadowed in 1989, um, there is an emerging relationship, and perhaps alliance is too strong a word, but a good relationship emerging between Central Europe um, and, <coughs> and Israel, um, symbolized in part by the recent visit of Prime Minister Netanyahu to, to Budapest and his meetings with, uh, with Prime Minister Orban. So there's a rich stew of topics here. Um, at the same time, a rich series of topics which for which we need guidance. And I think in Professor Gilboa, we have found the man. After he has spoken, we'll have a brief break for refreshments. Then um, I will invite our commentator onto the platform. Um, and uh, when I, I'll introduce him then. And uh, after he has spoken, and there's been some debate between the two principals, we will throw the discussion open to the floor. But for the moment, thanks for being here. And Professor Gilboa, welcome. And I give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sullivan, for your nice introduction. This is going to disturb you. Uh, uh, so, um, maybe you should change seats. Uh, thanks also for the Nube Institute for, for hosting us. Um, first, I want to say that this organization, which I created a few years ago, because uh, we have felt that uh, that there is not enough understanding, or at least in-depth understanding of what is happening in the Middle East, uh, around the world. Uh, the, this is a, a non-political uh, 
uh, non-profit. We do not subscribe to any political ide ideology. I do not represent uh, the government or official policy. We don't get uh, funding from any official sources. We speak our mind, basically based on our research. And I'm thankful for, for the, the New Institute for the opportunity to speak to you uh, this afternoon about, uh, about, this, about this topic, U.S.-Israel relations, cooperation or, uh, or confrontation. And you will be able to see that uh, we have to cover a lot of ground here, and not, uh, not just um, the direct relations. So I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'll speak for about, I don't know, 30 minutes or so. And then uh, later on, I'll be happy to discuss uh, other issues as well. So if you look at uh, several books written about the EU and Israel, you will find uh, titles such as Uneasy Neighbors, A State Beyond the Pale, Europe's Problem with Israel, The War of Western Europe Against Israel, all kinds of uh, negative and disturbing titles. And so I think it would be fair to describe the relationship as uneasy. And um, on the one hand, uh, the EU is a major trade partner of Israel. Uh, Israel and um, Europe share similar values. Uh, there, has, there is a problematic history from the Spanish expulsion to the Holocaust. Uh, but official policies of the EU, and I am focusing now on the EU official policies about Israel, are questionable and counterproductive. There are differences between the EU and the United States, especially now with the uh, election of uh, President Trump. There are differences uh, between the EU and member states, specific member states, differences be between Western and Eastern European states or Central European states. And finally, the EU, uh, not finally, the EU supports, and I'm going to show that, organizations which delegitimize and dehumanize Israel. And finally, uh, there is a lot of hostile media, especially uh, in Western Europe, and some problems with public opinion so I'll be speaking about some of these issues. Uh, this is uh, the trade record between Israel and the EU. So in, in 2016, uh, the exports were about $21 billion. The EU is the number one trade partner of Israel. The United States is second, second place, a little bit behind $21 billion. Israeli exports is in, in the green. Can you see this? It's okay? Uh, so uh, the, um, imports is about uh, $13 billion. You can see the, the blue represents uh, the difference. So major trade partner. So this is why the European Union is very important for Israel uh, as a trade partner. Um, oh, sorry. Cooperation. So it's cooperation versus, uh, versus uh, conflict. Uh, and so cooperation we can find uh, in high tech. Uh, Israel uh, is also called the startup nations. Israel has uh, startups more than, the, the, more than Great Britain, France, and Germany combined. Second place only to the United States. Uh, leading in what is known as clean tech. Energy, uh, in recent years, Israel discovered huge gas deposits in the Mediterranean, belongs to itself. And uh, it is establishing a new alliance, economic alliance, with Cyprus and Greece, building a pipeline for gas from Greece to Central European countries. Uh, the idea is to replace, to a certain extent, the uh, Russian gas supply to Central Europe. Uh, in agriculture and medicine, Israel is also a leading power. So cooperation exists and could be expanded in all of these areas. Cooperation, too, deals with political issues, some of them very obviously 
very, very sensitive. Uh, terrorism and immigration, the two are connected. Israel, unfortunately, has accumulated substantial experience in fighting radical Islamic terrorism. Um, this is known as the lone wolf syndrome that has emerged in recent years in Belgium, France, United States, uh, uh, Britain. How to deal with those lone wolf terrorists? This is something that Israel has accumulated experience. It's not easy, it's very difficult. If there, is a, if there is a terrorist organization behind it, you have intelligence, you know what to do. But the lone wolf terrorist is, is a major challenge. So there is very strong cooperation between Israel and the EU, as well as with European countries on, on fighting terrorism, intelligence, doctrines, equipment. Here I begin to come uh, to the issues that divide Israel from Europe. The number one issue is not the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It is the Iran nuclear deal. The Iran nuclear deal for Israel and all of the Sunni Arab countries and maybe even all the Arab countries in the Middle East, the, one, the number one challenge has been in the last five years has been Iran. Yeah, specifically, the Iran nuclear deal and the Iran activities uh, in Syria. So here there is a huge gap between Israel and the EU and with some uh, European countries. So I want to explain a little bit about it. First of all, this is, this is a major issue, the experiments with missiles. The UN Security uh, Council Resolution 2231 of July 20, 2015, which approved the nuclear deal, also prohibited Iran from developing missiles. And there was an addition to it. Missiles that can carry nuclear weapons. So Iran says, oh, we do not develop any missiles that can carry nuclear weapons. Therefore, we can experiment with all kinds of, of missiles. But every student, first year student of international relations, knows that these kind of missiles that Iran is developing are good only for nuclear weapons. So, the, so Iran is really violating, violating this basic element of the nuclear deal. <coughs> this is, this is a, a, a missile. Now, how do we know about missiles uh, in Iran? First of all, much of it first appears in military parades in Pyongyang. There is very strong cooperation and collaboration on missiles and nuclear technology between North Korea and Iran. So this particular missile is called Ho Song Tang. So you can see it in a military parade in North Korea. And then just in the last, in the last parade, incidentally, the body in Iran which is responsible for nuclear infrastructure as well as for missiles is not the regular army. It's the Republican Guards the Revolutionary Guards. And so they have a parade once a year. So this is a missile that they um, had on parade just recently, a few months ago. It's called Khoram Shar, identical to this one. And this one is developed by North Korea to carry nuclear weapons. So, and this is also quite interesting on um, January um, 9, January 4th, uh, two 2017, uh, Jawad Zarif, who is Iran's foreign minister, said, Iran will not use ballistic missiles to attack any country. Okay. He forgot that uh, on September 2016, Iran tested a ballistic missile carrying the message, Israel must be wiped out. Now, this is, this is written here, both in Persian and Hebrew, even in Hebrew. Israel should be wiped out. 
defensive? This is just for defensive measures or for something else? So Israel has a huge problem with Iran and um, Iran's missiles and also with Iran's uh, attempt to uh, dominate Syria. So you can see Iran already um, uh, has a, a proxy in Lebanon called Hezbollah and Hamas in Gaza. And so Iran uh, threatens Israel both conventionally and also uh, with missiles and, and nuclear weapons. So um, uh, John said earlier about the changing alliances in the Middle East. I'll say something about it in a minute. But uh, <coughs> for, for Israel, Iran is the major threat. Uh, I think that the, the nuclear deal was poorly negotiated. Is it not a good deal? But I'm not suggesting to cancel it now. So when Trump said that he wants to cancel the deal, I think this is a mistake. The, the deal should not be canceled. But the deal should be supplemented by other deals, by other agreements on other issues. And I was very happy to hear, uh, I think yesterday, uh, Manuel Macron of France saying, uh, telling Iran, we have to now negotiate a, a, another agreement about the issues left out of the nuclear deal, such as missiles and behavior and interventions in Middle Eastern um, hot spots. So this is this is this is uh, this is one major um, area of uh, disagreement and even confrontation between Israel and Iran. And on this issue, I must say that there is a complete political consensus in Israel. The opposition, the Labour Party, the left, all opposed the nuclear deal. All are concerned about Iran. This is not a partisan issue. People, people in Israel are divided on many issues, not on this one. And I also have to say that if Arab countries and Israel agree on anything, better someone should, then someone should listen. So this is the Iran thing. The next issue is the Israeli-Palestinian issue. So first of all, it is still being called the Middle East conflict or the Middle East peace process. And this was invented in Europe. The whole idea of the Middle East peace process was invented, invented in Europe. The assumption here was that this is the source of all problems, conflicts, um, revolutions in the Middle East. And if only the Israeli-Palestinian conflict could be resolved, the Middle East would become a Garden of Eden. Now, this has never been the true. It has never been valid. But in the last, uh, say, five or six years, since uh, the eruption of the Arab Spring, obviously it was proven wrong. Still, I visited the EU in Brussels just, just a year ago, they still talk about the Middle East peace process. This is just a, a complete distortion of what is happening in the region, what is happening in the area. This, has never, this is not the major conflict. This is not the major issue. It is a major issue for the parties themselves, but not for the region. And even if tomorrow this conflict is resolved, this still we will see a lot of violence, problems, terrorism, um, in the Middle East. So this is the first comment. Second comment, I look at these kind of statements made by a senior uh, politicians in Europe. <coughs> this is, for example, Claire Short. She made that, that statement on September 13. The oppression of the Palestinian people is the major cause of violence in the world. Major cause of the violence in the world? Where did you get that? I have, uh, even for in this particular uh, PowerPoint presentation, I have like a whole uh, discussion about violence in the world. The, the violence in the Israeli-Palestinian arena is, is not nice. It's the least violent in the world. In the last five years or so, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Muslims killed Muslims, basically. And in some other places also in the world, in Africa, in Asia, and then she, she said, 
Israel undermines the international community's reaction to global warming. Hey, where you get that? There's some people are so absurd. But the problem is that there are some people who listen to them. This is the Swedish foreign minister who said about the recent terrorist attacks in Paris. Palestinian despair prompts attacks like Paris. Okay, why? One wonders where she got that idea. This is completely out of touch with reality. Well, you see, this is uh, Jose Saramago, Portuguese Nobel Prize winning. He said on, uh, on April 12, 2002, what is happening in Palestine is a crime as what happened at Auschwitz. Auschwitz, systematic killing, concentration camps. This is a Nobel Prize uh, winner in literature. There has been many, this is in Europe. This comes basically from Europe, from Western Europe in primarily, from France, Britain, Belgium, uh, all the Scandinavian countries. See, there is minimizing the Holocaust and accusing Israel of Nazism. Gaza is Auschwitz. Never again in Palestine, Holocaust. This is Europe. And Israel branded as racist and Nazi-like. You see? Israel, the Fourth Reich. See this, never again. For world peace, Israel must be destroyed. A 12-year-old kid. This is in London, in Trafalgar Square. What else we need? That's another issue that I want to speak briefly about. That is an unusual phenomenon that I investigated myself. Europe, directly and indirectly, the EU and some other countries, uh, Western Europe and Scandinavian countries, are funding many NGOs in Israel, many NGOs in Israel, millions of euros and dollars, NGOs that ostensibly are operating to promote human rights, minority rights, so they use the political correctness of human rights narrative. The problem is that Europe does not care where the money goes to, and we have investigated that and found, and I have a, a lot of information about it, the European Union itself provides annually 22 million euros to many of those uh, NGOs. Ma some of them are denying Israel's right to exist, are inciting to hatred, violence, and terrorism. This is the business of Europe, to encourage that kind of behavior. Is this contributing to human rights? Is this contributing to peace? or exactly to the opposite result. So here you have all kinds of information about it, whom they support in Israel, in the West Bank, and Gaza. I have a list of all kinds of, uh, of organizations like that. Then another issue that, uh, that is a problem with Europe-Israeli relations is labeling uh, boycotting goods from the West Bank. The West Bank was taken from Jordan in, 2000, in, in uh, 1967, known as the Six Day War. And since then, Israel is holding to this, terri to this territory. So in September 2015, the European Union decided to uh, boycott goods <laughs> from the West Bank. Now, this, this would have been a legitimate political act had it been uh, applied to all cases or to all similar cases. Oh, you want to know which, case, which similar cases? I'll show you. One is India, Pakistan, Kashmir, for example. Kashmir is uh, seen by Pakistan as occupied by India and by India as, as an area belongs to themselves. European Union did not bother uh, to boycott goods from, from uh, Kashmir. China uh, uh, occupies Tibet. 
Turkey uh, occupies north, northern Cyprus. And this is even more remarkable and even more outrageous because Cyprus is an EU member since 2005. And northern Cyprus is occupied by Turkey since 1974. Had the European Union demanded to label goods from northern Cyprus? The answer is no. Morocco occupies Western Sahara in 1975. Russia, the Crimea, 2014. So the only, the only country which uh, is in a similar condition that is, um, is labeled is Israel. And you do that if you discriminate and you apply this rule um, discriminately, then it's discrimination. This is the UN. The UN is the most, the most ineffective, corrupt international organization. It is highly biased on Israel. I have all kinds of statistics of resolutions. The most biased and the most outrageous organization is the so-called United Nations Human Rights Council, where the champions of human rights in the world, such as Iran, Cuba, China, Saudi Arabia, the champions of human rights are telling other countries how to respect human rights. So what is outrageous about this organization is that, you see on the left, these are the number of resolutions made on Israel, and you can see 67, last 2016. 67 on Israel, 19 on Syria, uh, 12 on Myanmar, North Korea number nine, you can see. 67 on Israel. Not only that, human, the UN Human Rights Council has, an, has item seven on the agenda just for Israel. So the whole world is one item. Israel is item number seven. And why I am mentioning it uh, in relation to Europe? Because Europe supports all of those terrible, outrageous uh, decisions. These are the members, the European members of the United Nations uh, Council on Human Rights, Belgium, Germany, Portugal, Switzerland, UK, North, uh, Northern Ireland. On the left, you see the champions of human rights, right? China, Cuba, Venezuela, Congo, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Qatar. Now, Europe participates in this ugly game without no hesitations, no problems, no constraints. So, in the last uh, year or so, there were all kinds of resolutions made by UNESCO is another example. Europe abstained from such absurd resolutions such as defining the Temple Mount as a, a Muslim uh, holy place. Just a Muslim holy place. And the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron as a Palestinian holy place. This is ridiculous. But these resolutions are made with European abstention. So abstention, so what? These resolutions are passed. This is a major, a major issue that Israel has with the European Union. The last thing is about media coverage, and this is something that I, uh, I am the director of a center for international communication at Bailan University um, outside of Tel Aviv. We have conducted extensive research about media coverage of what is happening in Israel and the Middle East, and you find false reporting. Uh, false reporting means like reporting things that did not happen. Exaggerations, double standards, questionable sources, baseless associations, ridiculous analogies, selective and tendentious interviews, omissions, no context. I can support any of uh, those failures with many, many examples. I have a few examples here. Uh, this, is, this is an interesting caricature of CNN. Now, this is also interesting. Uh, you see, you can see what the media captures. It's exactly the opposite of what is happening on the ground. These are all kinds. This is BBC, BBC News. Palestinians shot dead after Jerusalem attack kills two. See? The problem is that this Palestinian was shot 
because he killed two. Can you tell that from the from the from the title here? And the same thing is uh, the same thing. You can find here all kinds of, of issues like this. This is an interesting. This happened on November 18, 2014. Just to illustrate to you my point. Now, why am why this is Europe? Because first of all, these are European media outlets, and secondly, the bias comes from from cues that leaders provide the media, from from information uh, that that the media supplies, that that the, the politicians, the leaders supply. So so this. Look, look at this. This is, uh, what is this? This is CNN. Four Israelis, two Palestinians dead in Jerusalem. Problem is that the four Israelis were killed by Palestinian terrorists. So you look at this. Four Israelis, two Palestinians dead in Jerusalem. You don't see anything here. When, it, when, it's, when, it, when the report is on the other side, you will see exactly what, what, what happens. This Daily Telegraph. Israeli police fired on Palestinians in a synagogue. Oh, they came to pray in a Jewish synagogue. What, what a nice picture. Right? Well, they came to kill and they kill. The Daily Telegraph of London. This is also quite interesting. Uh, Gaza village flooded as Israel opens dam gates. The problem is that there is no such gate. There's no such thing. There's no dam of that thing and no gate was opened. So you can see a lot, a lot of trouble here. So in conclusion, I, I think I can conclude now. I, I'll be happy to go into uh, still European positions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which are also missing the point. I'm happy to do it a little bit later, because I don't think that Europe understands the root cause of the conflict, and therefore are still pushing for a solution that, uh, that ignores the root cause, we can talk about it a little bit later. In conclusion, you, I, I've spoken more about, say, issues of disagreement uh, rather than agreement, but I, I summarized the main, um, the main um, areas of, colla of collaboration. There's much more collaboration between Israel and Central European countries. So much of what I said about, so the collaboration is both with West Europe and Central Europe, with Europe. Most of the confrontation is with West Europe. But unfortunately, West Europe still dominates the EU. And so, so I spend more time about those confrontational issues. And Thank you for coming and for listening. I'll be happy to answer your questions a little bit later. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me? Is that working? Good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've just had an extremely stimulating start to the discussions today. And uh, I look forward to a vigorous and interesting debate between the platform and uh, between the speakers on the platform and between the platform and the floor. Um, it's my great pleasure now to introduce the, the commentator on uh, Professor Gulbo's remarks, and this is a distinguished Hungarian uh, expert on foreign security policy, uh, the director of the International Center for Democratic Transition. Uh, there's a great deal more in the biographies you have been given uh, about his career in, um, in, in diplomacy um, and in uh, strategic discussions. Um, but I think um, I, I will simply leave it at, at that for the moment. You can read that and to say we're very grateful he's agreed to be here. He's, a, he's in a strong position in which to comment on what you've already heard. And we'll ask uh, um, Ambassador uh, or Dr. Ishvan uh, Joamati to be begin the second session by responding. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's a stimulating place and a stimulating uh, subject to, to talk about. Uh, to some extent, I'm in a difficult situation because I, I love to contradict. I have to, to, uh, to question what others say. But uh, what the professor has said, 
I, I really cannot really contradict. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to either, but uh, but it's it's not, and and it's very little that 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 I can add to it. Uh, what I could do uh, will be uh, probably tr trying to explain why it is happening, why Europe is is cha has changed or is is in the process of changing its uh, approach to Israel and to to the Middle East. Um, what I will say will be full of contradictions. It will be not a con it will be a controversial. Uh, argument, which is, is good, I think, because we can we will be able to to discuss. But but this is to a large extent what I I think is the uh, is the case. The first reason is is a very simple one, but it it's not widely recognized. The first uh, case that I remember of uh, when a uh, one of the the really leading uh, political uh, leaders, I would say. Uh, maybe a, 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 an incoming statesman, we don't know yet. Uh, I'm talking about Emmanuel Macron. He has the potential to become a statesman, but we don't know yet. And we don't want to make the mistake of the, of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee giving the Nobel Peace Prize to somebody who, he, who never deserved it. Uh, but uh, I think uh, this, this man uh, started his, his career uh, not only uh, not only winning uh, a landslide in the elections, very surprisingly, which is in the brackets I want to to add, which is extremely important because it shows that people, uh, voters who want to vote against the traditional elite, have a choice other than extreme right. And I think it's a very important message from of of the election of Emmanuel Macron, but he did something else when when Prime Minister Netanyahu visited France. He said that anti-Zionism is the modern form of anti-Semitism. And I think this is a very important statesman, statement. It is very true. Because being openly anti-Semitic is, is, is out of fashion these days. Some people love it, love it but it's, it's politically incorrect and many people don't, don't want to look anti-Semitic. But it's really very fashionable to be anti-Zionist, to be against Israel, and telling, no, no, this is not, not anti-Semitism. We are against Israel because Israel is bad, Israel is a dictatorship, Israel is killing the, uh, the Arabs, etc., etc. It's not the Jews. The Jews are good, but Israel is bad. And unfortunately, of course, you will find Jews also who, who, who agree. So, uh, I think this is one of the, the important reasons today that we see this, uh, this happening, uh, that those who are anti-Semitic but don't want to, to be openly anti-Semitic uh, play this card of anti-Zionism, anti-Israel. Secondly, uh, I want to quote, and some people might stone me because of this, because I call Kovash Shlomo a friend of mine. Uh, many people will disagree and many will agree with that, but that's not the important thing. The important thing that he wrote an article about a year ago, in which he said that Jews have to, and Israel, have to start thinking about uh, finding a, a new rationale, a new justification for the existence of Israel and for the recognition of, of Jews in the world, other than the Holocaust. And I think it's a very important statement. It's not downplaying the importance of Holocaust. It's not suggesting that we should forget about it. It's not suggesting that we should not deal with it and we should not address it every week, every day if necessary. But it means that for today's people, for the people of today, especially for the young generation, it's not enough. Moreover, it's not only not enough, it's irritating. Because the, the people in their teens and twenties uh, tell, what on earth do I have to do with Holocaust? It was a, sorry, this is a radio. Uh, we know it was terrible, even those who think it was terrible. It, it must never happen again. We must do everything, but I'm not guilty of it. And my parents are not guilty of it. So why do I have to pay anything, any price for it? So, uh, and price is not money, uh, but political price. 
So I think we, we need to, to tell the people why Israel is important, why Israel is as it is, why Israel is still and will unfortunately be for a long time uh, the only democracy in the Middle East, that it is a democracy, it's a different democracy, but it's not a different democracy because Jews are not democratic, but because of the situation Israel is in. And uh, even human rights uh, activists, I think I am one of them, uh, but even human rights activists uh, know that uh, human rights, even according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, must be limited for the sake of common health and security. So. We need to explain that. We need to understand that Israel is in a unique situation. And unfortunately, many dictators justify their limitation on human rights, telling that, oh, Israel is doing the same. But when you hear the uh, president of the Philippines telling this, comparing the Philippines to, the, to, to Israel, that does not sound very convincing. But it's a simply easy. Uh, explanation, uh, and it's it's appealing to those who who who, who like Israel actually even. But they think that if if Israel is doing it, it should be right. Of course, many people think that if Israel is doing it, it should be wrong. But, but that's an, that's another group of people. So I think we we really need to do much more explaining about the the situation, the situation in Israel and of Israel, uh, and why Israel is doing what what Israel is doing. I think it's also very important to, uh, to explain the facts. You know, uh, many years ago when we were campaigning for NATO membership of Hungary, there was a, a meeting where I was, I was State Secretary of Defense that time, and I was, of course, defending the Hungarian NATO membership, which I still do. And my counterpart in the debate was Mr. Churka. I don't know, I probably everybody, I mean, everybody uh, remembers Mr. Churka. Um, so, uh, Mr. Churka was giving his usual speech that Hungarians are a great nation, that they are better than anybody else, the Jews are not good, they, are, they want uh, uh, to destroy uh, Europe and Hungary, etc. Uh, but Hungarians are really great. And he illustrated, as Hungarians usually do, the, uh, uh, the greatness of, Hunga of, Hungaries, of Hungarians by the number of Nobel, Peace Pro Nobel Prize winners. And if, if this was, of course, a, an easy task for me. So I, when he finished, I said that, Mr. Churk, I just want to ask you one question. Do you know that this is the exception of one, all Hungarians who won Nobel Prize were Jewish? That with the exception of one, all of them won it when they were living in the United States or abroad, at least not in Hungary. And the one who was not Jewish and he who won it in Hungary, uh, left Hungary one year after the Nobel Prize because of anti-Semitism in Hungary. Mr. Churka became uh, so angry that he left the room. But this is something that Hungarians don't know. The Churka argument is used by, the Hungarian, by many Hungarians still, and we do not explain them, that those who, who did it were Hungarians, but they were Hungarians, Jews as well. So you cannot be anti-Semitic and tell the Hungarians are great because of the number of of Nobel Prize winners. But this is only a very simple example that I want to, uh, uh, to share with you. I always use this one when, I, when I'm discussing this with my students or whoever. I have a lot of students who belong to Yobik, unfortunately, but uh, that makes life much more interesting. And my lecture is much more interesting in the, in the university, at least for me. So I think we, uh, we need to rethink the whole thing. We need to rethink uh, the whole uh, the whole argumentation about Israel, why Israel is important, that the origins of Israel go back to the Holocaust, but that's not the only reason. This is only not, probably only not, not, not the main reason. Uh, my favorite Israeli politician is Golda Meir. And uh, uh, Golda Meir said once that, that no, Israel cannot be the, 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 the chosen people of God because God gave Israel, the Jews, the only place in the Middle East where there is no oil. This has changed by now. So maybe uh, Jewish, Jews are still the, the, uh, the chosen people. 
So uh, I think we, we really have to, to think about it. We really have to give a good argument. And, and I hope that, that Israel, while continuing, of course, to argue uh, the, the, uh, the facts uh, about the Human Rights Council, etc., UNESCO, and, and many other things, we need to find positive arguments why Israel is, is important for, for the world, why Israel is defending European security in the Middle East. Israel is not only defending Israel's, Israel's security in, in the Middle East. Israel is the, probably the last and the strongest bastion of, uh, of security uh, uh, of Europe uh, in the Middle East. So I think we, we need to, uh, to really uh, find uh, new lines of argument. Uh, it's not very difficult. It's not very difficult because Israel has to has a lot of things to show. I would, if I, if I may be also a little critical of Israel, I think Israel should be a little more flexible, flexible in, in argumentation. Not only uh, telling the, the sheer facts as, as they are, but also explaining more and show, uh, uh, show, that, uh, show facts. You know, when, when I, I read that, that uh, when Israel established this security gate, you remember a few months ago, and the Arabs were cutting all uh, all ties to Israel, uh, I'm not Arab, sorry, the, the, the uh, Palestinian authority, I said, okay, let's do it mutually. So let's Israel also cut the ties, not pay anything, because the Palestinian authority is paid by Israel, not provide electricity. Shall we do that? No. But I, I think we, we really need to explain uh, the situation, how, how positive in many things, Israel is uh, behaving in the Middle East. Um, my critical remark is the following. Uh, we, we are used to call everything a terrorism, because terrorism is a, is a good brand mark to, to deliver a negative message. While I think that uh, in, uh, in uh, how should I call it, Israel, Palestine, the whole territory together, uh, there are elements of guerrilla warfare too, not only terrorism. And I, I think if we, if we blame everybody as a terrorist who fights against Israeli soldiers, or for that matter, American soldiers, uh, or, and I, I, I want to drive this, this parallel a little too far. If you think back to September 11th, the two planes that hit uh, the World Trade Centers were terrorists, no doubt about it. But you might ask questions about the plane that hit the Pentagon, because that was a military target. So was it terrorism or was it guerrilla warfare? I think it was terrorism for many reasons, and I think I could argue. But we, we should understand that it is not as, as simple as, as, as we, we portray. And the, the problem is that if we, if we present everybody as a terrorist, we cut the, the, uh, uh, the opportunity to negotiate while we could negotiate with many of them. Um, I could continue, but I see that I should stop here. I see one in your eyes. Oh, well, what? <laughs> uh, but I think we will have some, some more opportunity for, to answer questions and, uh, and continue our, our debate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I'm sorry if I inadvertently <laughs> cut you off, but, <laughs> but no, 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 no. Um, but I would just like to ask one, quest, one clarification question before turning to Professor Gilboa, and that is, um, you know, you mentioned um, needing uh, uh, another reason uh, other than the Holocaust for the existence of Israel. Well, of course, um, does, um, does Israel, or does Hungary, does Great Britain need a reason to exist? I mean, they do exist, they are, they're there. Do, they, do we not simply accept their existence as some kind of right thing? And secondly, what would you say that um, they, since the Balfour Declaration was in 1917 and the Holocaust occurred, you know, almost 30 years later, um, what, in a sense, why did the world, or certainly important powers, believe that Israel should be founded, there should be a national home for the Jews, uh, which, which might still be applicable today? Well, um, first of all, just as, a, as I, I uh, use the opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, tell something that might sound a joke, Hungary does need to 
justify its existence in many many cases vis-a-vis uh, -vis some neighbors and some some others, but that's not the good answer, I think. Uh, the, the simple answer is because people are questioning the Israel's right to existence. They are not right. It doesn't mean they are right. But as they are questioning, and it's, this, is, this is a widespread uh, question that people ask, I think we need to, to find an answer. And also because it's not, di not difficult to find an answer. Uh, but the Balfour Declaration, you know, it's, uh, words are words and deeds are deeds. The Balfour Declaration, was followed by a, a shameful uh, British policy vis-a-vis -vis Israelis and, and Jews and Israel. So uh, it's, a, it's a mixed baggage, actually, uh, for, for, for the Brits. Uh, but I think the Balfour Declaration was one of, the, one of the, the bright moments of British foreign policy, that they have, they have recognized that, that something needs to be done about that. And I think um, being a Hungarian, we... we uh, we need to mention the, the, the father of, of Zionism, uh, Tivadar Herzl, uh, who, who launched this, uh, this whole movement, and uh, probably by the time of the Balfour Declaration, the Brits who, who, are, um, who are smart and who, who can, at least could, uh, I'm not sure about uh, after the Brexit that they still can, but they could, could look forward uh, and, uh, and uh, formulate foreign policy that were forward looking. I think they have recognized that there is no way of uh, avoiding, but they were far from being, being uh, uh, enthusiastic about it. They did not really support it after the declaration. They did, did a lot of things not to, 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 not, to, not to allow it to uh, happen. So uh, it's a mixed package for the Brits. Well, thank you. Um, now I'm going to uh, turn to Professor Gilboa and ask him actually the same question, because obviously until we discuss this foundational question and get it out of the way, we can't go on to some of these other ones. Th thank you very much, Dr. Is it G Giramati or Giramati? Ishvan. <laughs> thank you very much, Ishvan. And I, I reciprocate. I, I agree with most of what you have said. And this is a, this is a, a real problem. Um, the need to justify your existence. No country, you're, you're, you're quite right, uh, Mr. Solomon. No other country's existence is being challenged. Not even one country in the world is threatened with, with destruction. Like Iran is a re reputable member of the United Nations. Uh, the president of Iran, Rouhani, who is supposed to be a moderate, is welcome there every year. And still, uh, his people say that Israel should not exist. This is absurd on, on its face. So on the one hand, I, uh, you know, my family lived in Israel for generations. So even according to the Palestinians, I may, I, if I, I may stay there. Uh, but, um, but I think that, um, that um, this is the root cause of, uh, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and so maybe I can s say a few words about it. Because uh, we are being told all the time that the number one obstacle to peace between Israel and Palestinians is the Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And number two, the rightist uh, government and, uh, and, and the rightist policies of uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I think I myself oppose settlements from the beginning, and uh, I don't think that it's a good idea. It's, it's not helpful. Uh, but this is not the number one reason for the absence of peace. It is, it is maybe number five or number six or number seven. And the focus on settlements by the United States and the EU uh, simply not only completely display a misunderstanding of what is really happening, but also increases Palestinians' intransigence and rejectionism. Why am I saying that? This is, this is a philosophical issue. Uh, we are led to believe that the main problem in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is territory. Territory taken in 1967 from Jordan. And therefore, the solution is partition. If two national movements claim the same piece of land, what is the reasonable solution? Divide the land. The problem is that all the petition solutions have always been rejected by the Arabs. The first 
the first solution was already in 1937, called Peel Commission of, of Great Britain. Rejected. UN resolution, petition resolution, November 1947, rejected. The West Bank and was under Jordanian control from 1947-48 to 1967. And Gaza was under Egyptian control. Why didn't they establish a state from 1948 to 1967? Why? Now, there were governments in Israel on the left. In recent years, there was uh, the Rabin government, there was a Hood Barak government, there was Olmert in the center, and all of their proposals for resolution were rejected. So something is, is problematic here. So I'm asking myself, and you will never hear what I'm saying now, you will, you will never hear in public discussion. You always focus on settlements. But what I'm telling you is the root cause of the problem. Because the Palestinians think that they are a real national movement. And the Jews are only a religion and therefore do not deserve a state. This is the problem. This is the problem that you've just mentioned, justification. So the Jews do not deserve a state. And Israel is a colonial, imperialist, political entity that, like any entities of this kind, will disappear one day. So, how do I know all of that? Because I've looked into the history of what happened since, since you know, since the Balfour Declaration even. And even, even a, few, a few days ago, the Palestinians are really rejecting the Balfour Declaration. Because the Balfour Declaration was speaking about partition of the land, essentially. And so they want, to, they want Britain to apologize and to pay them reparations. So I want to, I want to emphasize again, so the Palestinians do not use the term two states to two peoples, only two states. For them, there's only one people, themselves. Two states to two peoples only the West uses, and the United States and, and the EU. There's no Israel on the maps of the Palestinian Authority. Now, many people think that the, the whole West Bank and even Gaza are still being held by Israel. Israel left Gaza in, in 2006, 2005. Dismantled all the settlements. Israel dismantled all the settlements in Sinai. The settlements is the biggest issue. Or something else. So still people think that Israel occupies Gaza. And the Palestinians say that Israel occupies Gaza. So the West Bank, about 45% of the West Bank is in Palestinian hands. They have police, they have a parliament. No, they don't have elections, too bad, they don't have elections. But they have a parliament, uh, they control the, the territory they, they are in, 45%. Not, not 100%, but not the whole territory is occupied. And so, so um, they, they have an educational system. In the books, in the educational books, Israel map does not exist. And they refuse to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And they insist on what is known as the right of return of Palestinian refugees, which is, uh, which is also uh, a scandal of its own, to what is Israel today. So if it had been only the territorial issue, if it had been only the settlements, then this conflict would have been resolved years ago. Since, since the United States and the EU still talking about the territorial problem as the main problem, all initiatives, all peace proposals that are based on this idea fail and will continue to fail. Can I just, um, it appears to me, then what you're saying is you're responding. Um, 
Uh, justification. Uh, you, you, the justification being that you don't need a justification in the sense that Israel, like any other country, has the right to exist as of itself, so to speak. By the way, let me just um, add that I don't think anymore it's fair to say that Israel is entirely the only country in the world threatened at least theoretically, with um, w with not having a right to exist, the uh, that uh, the argument. No, yes, no, quite. But no, exactly. But the, the 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 argument that you you cited is actually now used by radical leftists about all the settler states. I mean, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina. Uh, they are all said to be states which, in a sense, don't have a right to exist where they are because um, they dispossess the original inhabitants and and so on. So, the, 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 this argument exists out there and. You know, the point thing about arguments is they remain theories until it looks as though somebody can act upon them, and then they become something else. But, yeah, but yeah, just one, set, one, one word. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. This is also interesting because because the radical left look at the Palestinians as the natives. That's right. The Jews are the natives, not the Palestinians, because the Arabs took this territory and settled it uh, centuries ago. So this, this is a complete distortion of, of history itself. It's fair to say that virtually everywhere has been owned by somebody else at some other time. But, but, um, and that's particularly true, of course, for Europe. But, but I want to come back then, uh, if I could, you, uh, Mr. Giamatti. I mean, and with them, we, I suppose we must move on to more direct political topics. But, but it seems to me that you asked a very good question. It stimulated a strong reply. But what's your own answer to it? What is the, what justification post-Holocaust can there be for Israel if you think it needs one? And I repeat, I don't think it needs one. Many others do think it needs one, and therefore I think we need to provide one to to be more convincing than than we are, and also to avoid the uh, uh, the situation where young generations increasingly uh, don't feel uh, attracted to Israel because they hear the Holocaust argument, and because they do hear the Holocaust argument all the time, uh, and they don't feel it uh, it is it is a, uh, it has anything to do with uh, with them. So I think this is uh, this is the reason is not that it's a, it's a, a legitimate uh, uh, question, but we need to answer it in our own interest. So what is my, my answer? Is that my answer is that, as usual, uh, the answer is much more complicated than, than the question. The answer is that Israel is a democracy, and we need to explain how the Israeli democracy works and why Israeli democracy in certain aspects is limited more than, than German democracy. Uh, or than even French democracy. So I think it's, it's very important to, uh, to explain. We need to explain the difference that when Israel is, is limiting human rights, it's not the same as, as uh, Kim Jong-un limiting human rights. So it has, it has, Israel has good reasons, and we need to explain the, the, the reasons. I think we need to explain uh, the positive role Israel plays for the security of Europe in the Middle East, that Israel is basically holding uh, holding the uh, the security of of Europe to some extent, the key to the security of Europe to some extent in its hands. We need to explain how much Israel has has given to the world uh, in terms of of technology, of uh, of many other things um, uh, uh, that is un unquestionable. Hence my my argument about the Hungarian Nobel Prize winners. Uh, uh, and I think we we this this is the line of argument we uh, we, we we should follow. Uh, not again. I, I want to repeat because sometimes people misunderstand me. I don't think this is the case here. But it's not to forget about Holocaust. It's, it's not to not to remember Holocaust. It's not uh, not to tell about Holocaust the the young uh, generations. But I think they are. Uh, they think it's too much that they hear about it. That that they have nothing to do. Visit. They don't. Uh, they don't share responsibility uh, for for the Holocaust. So let's put Holocaust in its place uh, in their in their minds and in their hearts and uh, use it um, appropriately. But then also use other arguments. Actually, this is not only arguments for the existence of Israel. I think this is arguments to explain what what role Israel plays in the world. And that would be also the argument for for, it, uh, for its uh, uh, existence. So if you if you don't want to to, to accept that we need to argue for uh, why Israel has the right to exist, let's explain what is Israel doing for us 
why is Israel an important uh, ally and friend of, uh, of Europe and why it is totally wrong uh, what many of the Western European uh, gov even governments uh, do, that they undermine not only the security of Israel but their own security too. Well, I think that last point is a very good point to put to you, I mean, uh, Professor, because uh, there's a practical question here. How is, how is Israel going to survive? Um, it, it's, it's a very advanced power in, in technical terms. Um, it's doing all these other things that, we're, that um, uh, you, you just spoke about. Um, but it's still a, uh, it's still a small state. Um, surrounded by enemies and at the moment though those enemies seem to be quarreling in a most productive way from the standpoint of Israel um, when you look at what's happening in relation to um, Saudi Arabia Iran and the other powers uh, do you see a new sort of Middle East emerging not through um, the outbreak of universal benevolence but through um, the new considerations of reason of state okay uh this requires a one-hour lecture, but uh, in two minutes, uh, I think that uh, the way to survive is, uh, first of all, to depend on yourself and never on anybody else, regardless of the circumstances. Uh, uh, there were many times that um, people offered Israel to sign uh, a defense agreement with the United States. I, was op I opposed that because I said, you cannot depend on American presidents. Look at the, at the, at the present one. And so, so complete uh, uh, dependency, uh, self-dependency, number one. Number two, you have to have a very strong military. And we have a very strong military. Number three, you have to seek a political alliances with external and, in, and regional powers. And so you always have interests, common interests to develop. So obviously the relationship with the United States, I've written a whole book about it, called The Special Relationship, which is a special relationship uh, with the United States. This uh, will continue, uh, not forever, because there's nothing like forever, but it will continue, say, in the next generation or so. And in the Middle East, you have all kinds of opportunities that you have to develop. I believe that we sh Israel should do uh, more uh, to, uh, to achieve peace with the Palestinians. I think it depends more on the Palestinians than Israel, but still Israel should do uh, the most it can uh, to, to promote uh, negotiations and, 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 and peace. I don't think that peace as we understand it is even possible, but say, like the peace Israel has with Egypt. You know, it's peace that leaders sign it, it didn't spill over to, 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 pe to the people. We called it cold peace versus, versus, versus warm peace. But, but even cold peace is better than conflict and violence. And uh, as you have suggested yourself, there are all kinds of circumstances when countries recognize that, say, uh, so Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and we have a peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan. So peace is possible, uh, depending on the conditions. I, I want to tell you that I spoke just a few days ago about uh, Sadat's, uh, Anwar Sadat's uh, visit to Jerusalem uh, in November 1977, exactly 40 years, last week. And this is interesting because I did some study about the negotiations between Israel and Syria. This was, 19, this was uh, immediately after the signing of the Israel PLO uh, agreement in, the, in Washington, D.C. in September 1993. So there were two years of negotiations with Syria. The U.S. Secretary of State, Clinton administration, was Warren Christopher, a lawyer. So Warren Christopher uh, met with, with Assad, uh, Hafez al-Assad, the father of the president Assad, and he, and he, and he asked him, uh, we want to promote peace between Israel and, the, and, and Syria. What do you demand? What are your demands? He said, exactly, exactly what Sadat got. All of the territory. Fine. So he came back to the, 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 the then Israeli Prime Minister Rabin and said, you know, if you are ready to, uh, to uh, return all of the Golan Heights, which you captured in 1967, uh, Assad is ready to sign a, an agreement with you. 
So the rabbi in response was, well, he wants a deal like we Israel signed with Sadat. He should come to Jerusalem. Sadat came to Jerusalem, recognized Israel, even recognized Jerusalem, spoke with the parliament. If he were to do all of that, I'm ready to withdraw from all of the Golan Heights. He said that. I am ready to withdraw from all of the Golan Heights. He went back to Assad. Assad said, no, no, no. I'm not coming to Jerusalem. I'm not recognizing Israel. I'm not interested in peace. I don't want peace. I want all the territory. So this tells you something. This is, this is the psychology of situations like that. So, so Sadat was really a very courageous and he, a very courageous person. It's not true that he was assassinated because of the peace with Israel. This is a myth that is written in many books. It is, it is not true. He was, he was assassinated by the Muslim Brotherhood because of his policies towards Muslim Brotherhood. So I think that the more Israel frustrates the Palestinians, the more it creates alliances with Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, and other countries, the better its ability. I, 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 we have no doubts about survival. The question is how you behave. And I think what is quite interesting about Israel is that despite the conflict, it's still a democracy. Despite the conflict, it is, uh, it is a, a high-tech and start-up superpower. And it contributes uh, to the world in many ways, as, as Ichman suggested earlier. So we are optimistic people. And, and we think that uh, the chances for survival are very good. Uh, it, um, yes, I was going to. Let me just add one, one sentence as, as an illustration. If five years ago somebody would have told me, and I'm sure you too, that in the, in the, the conflict with, with uh, uh, Iran or anybody, Saudi Arabia will be the most important ally of Israel, I think we would, we would call him a, a fool. And it happened. So nothing is, in, not, nothing is impossible. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure that um, there is also a relationship between this and the very moderate steps that Saudi Arabia is doing to modernize its society. And it will not end with, with the driving license for women. It will, it will continue. So I think this is a, a, a slow but steady uh, path for Israel and for Saudi Arabia. And, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia had already a peace plan before, so I think they will come up with, they might come up with something uh, in a few years' time. And I think this is the best way for Israel to, uh, to follow uh, towards a kind of a peace. My second thing is not, my second remark is not that, that positive. I think we can live with the Israeli Palestinian conflict. We cannot live for a long time with the, with the Iranian uh, nuclear conflict. But, I mean, we have survived decades with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We will survive one more decade if necessary. Thank you. In fact, the late Eli Kaduri uh, used to say that the, the, the Middle East, the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis wasn't so much the, a problem for the Middle East. It was a solution to a lot of problems in the Middle East because it enabled the Arab countries to play, blame Israel for everything that was going wrong and to divert anger. Um, uh, uh, before I throw it open to the floor, uh, I just since we are here in Budapest and since there was recently the visit of uh, 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 Prime Minister Netanyahu, and a great deal, great deal was written about that. I just must ask both of you very quickly, if you could, to say what, what, how serious this new relationship is and what you think is going to emerge from it. This time I'll ask you first. Well, I, I consider myself a Hungarian intellectual, so by profession I'm, I'm criticizing all governments all the time. Uh, this is one thing where I don't criticize the current or the previous Hungarian government. I think this has been a line uh, for Hungarian governments for, um, for, uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, I think this is uh, for the understanding of what, how important security is. And I, I think, of course, without uh, wanting to compare uh, Hungarian security issues with Israel security issues, uh, thanks God. Uh, but uh, I think the understanding is there. I think the, that, that uh, uh, I, I don't agree with those who think that, that uh, there is strong anti-Semitism in Hungary. Uh, there is anti-Semitism in Hungary, but it is not an aggressive type of anti-Semitism. I call it a salon anti-Semitism. That oh yes, of course I don't like the Jews, Jews but but my neighbor uh, Mr. Kuhn is a nice guy. So uh, there has been no 
no uh, real uh, provocations, no attacks, no killings in Hungary, unlike in many, uh, many other countries. Unfortunately, this is not the reputation that Hungary enjoys and therefore, or doesn't enjoy, uh, and therefore uh, I think it's very important to, uh, to have Israel telling what Israel thinks about, um, about Hungary in terms of existence or non-existence of, of anti-Semitism. For Israel, this relationship is important because, because you have an ally in the European Union and not one. I mean, more, uh, more than one. Sometimes uh, if Hungary is your ally in the European Union, it's, it's more counterproductive than not, but, but on the long run, I think it's very, uh, it's very important and very useful for Israel. So it's mutual benefits and mutual interest. I think that, that cannot be uh, uh, denied. Uh, what I would like to see more, actually, is much more cultural exchange, much more student exchanges, for instance, because I, I think the Fran Franco-German reconciliation really started with the uh, coal and steel community and the uh, uh, Deutsche Französisch Jugendwerk. I think we, we really should pay attention to uh, to that uh, that we uh, we let our our young people, uh, teenagers, uh, uh, know uh, each other's countries. I would invest much more money uh, in, into this, and I think that would help to ease uh, the the burden of anti-Semitism for the future generations. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, maybe one, maybe one sentence. Israel is the only Jewish state in the world, and it was established as, as, um, as the expression of self-determination. Zionism is the self-determination movement of the Jewish people. This is just justification. Uh, justification is that, as any other people, you deserve independence. Now, so Israel has always played a very delicate balance between uh, strategic interests and concern for Jews in, in several countries. So this is also true for Hungary. So Israel's mission is to protect Jews and Jewish life everywhere. So when there is, there is, there is some contradiction uh, between strategic interests and protecting Jews in a particular country, then you have to strike a balance. So in this particular case, what determines uh, the Jewish condition is the Jews who live in a particular country. What they feel counts. What, not what do you think they should feel, but how they feel. And I understand that uh, the Hungarian Jewry is concerned. And therefore, uh, if I were the Prime Minister of Israel, I would raise it with the Prime Minister of, of Hungary. And I think he raised it, I don't know and to what extent. So I think this is, this is the balance that, that should work. And if there is a very serious contradiction, I would prefer the mission to protect Jewish life uh, 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 more than, than strategic interests. So it's, it's a moral choice that you have to make at any, at any given point of time. Uh, th yes, you may. First of all, I, I, uh, first time I, I disagree with you, uh, maybe because I'm a strategic uh, singer, I, I, I deal with strat strategy all my life. Uh, you cannot protect Jewish life uh, in, in a country when, when you, if you do not protect your strategic interests. So I, I don't, because then if they do, the, the two contradict to each other, then, then uh, your own interests and the Jewish interests will suffer. So I would put them on, on equal footing, frankly speaking. There is one more parallel between Israel and Hungary, I must tell you. It's, uh, that uh, Israel is the only Jewish country in the world, and Hungary is the only Hungarian country in the world. So. <laughs> um, by the way, before we move on, uh, there is a... Uh, there is a country which is, in some respects, sit similar to the situation that that J Jewish J the Jews were in before I Israel. The Kurds, the Kurds, and the, the Kurds have an advantage which previously the Jews did not have, which is even if they don't have a state, uh, they have areas in which they are a dominant um, group, and those areas are generally contiguous. So. Um, I feel that until we we just briefly talk about what you think the Kurds should do, after all they're your neighbours, um, and we're all concerned about what the situation there is, um, and this all of a sudden has gone from being a theoretical to being a practical problem, what do you think should be done? Perhaps this is where I turn to you first. Well, so first of all, there are 30 million Kurds in the world. They are, um, they are divided into four countries. It's Iran, Iraq, Syria and Turkey. And the situation in Turkey 
is the most delicate and the most problematic because uh, the, the Kurds in Turkey uh, demand um, separation and autonomy for a long time. I thought that uh, at the beginning of the disintegration of Iraq and Syria, uh, the Kurds had the best opportunity ever to have a state. Uh, but then uh, there were all kinds of problems. Um, it seems that the leaders in each community have big egos. They disagree about many things and they could not unite uh, with the goal of establishing an independent state. I think that um, the referendum in, in Kurdish uh, Iraq was, was, was a mistake, uh, like the one in Catalonia, I think, uh, because it showed that there is a huge gap uh, between words and, and, and deeds. And the Iraqi army was able to, to capture the area there and even reduce the autonomy that they had before. Uh, the United States um, deserted the Kurds. European Union couldn't care less. The only country that really supports Kurdish independence is Israel. And there was some support. There's certain things that you can do, but no more than that. I think the United States made a huge mistake by not at least doing a little bit more than they did because I think independent Kurdistan is the most important uh, uh, way of containing Iran. And if Iran is the biggest threat, then you had to think otherwise. There were Iranian Shiite militias uh, that are very powerful now in Syria and Iraq. I don't know if you know, the Iranian uh, Shiite militia, the pro-Iranian Shiite militias in Syria today, have more people than the Islamic State. Thousands of people, more than the Islamic State. So, so I think that this is like a, a, a historical tragedy, that this opportunity was not seized. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to add another thing? Yeah. I, I just agree. I think it's a, a, the, the Kurds missed the historic opportunity, probably. Because once well, they, they saw that they will be rewarded for, the, for supporting the fight against Islamic State, that's a miscalculation. Politics never rewards you. Uh, they use you when, when you are useful. And now they don't need the Kurds, so they will not reward you. Uh, they should have uh, uh, started the process when they were needed, actually. Um, so, but um, I, I have had jokingly to add also the same that I said about Hungarian support within the European Union. Israeli support within the Middle East for somebody is not always very helpful, I must tell you. It, you're right, but that's, that's how it is. It's interesting that actually a number of people from Western Europe went to fight for the uh, for the Kurds in the same way as people went to fight for the Spanish Republic. Uh, um, th th that's been quite rare in recent years, that kind of thing. Right, now uh, let me throw open questions from the floor. I will favor particularly people who have not asked questions before. Uh, would somebody like to um, throw? Thanks, I'm Melissa O'Sullivan of the Danube Institute. Um, many years ago, we were at a private home in New York, and Norman Podoritz, who is a famous writer, a man who starts on the left and winds up as one of the original neocons, told me that he was trying to explain to the Israelis that, that all of the people on the left that were supporting them would drop them like a hot potato when they were no longer the victim. My question is, was he correct?
with the radical left, uh, especially in the United States, but also in Europe. I often speak at American uh, campuses, and what is going on there is it's unbelievable. They were taken over, but it's by the, not left. Left is okay. Radical left is not okay. And for one thing is that they are silencing people with other views. And this is on American campuses. So these people don't understand what freedom of academic freedom is, what freedom of speech is. Uh, I was, there were many, there were several instances where I was not allowed to speak. Incidentally, a year ago, I was in Slovakia. Uh, and, and there was another, there was an attempt to shut me, shut me off. I, I spoke, but the mere idea that you should not allow to speak on campus is this reprehensible. So the radical left is, is a huge problem. So the radical, the radical left, with whom the radical left joined forces, with the anti-Semitic right, and the Islamic radical groups. We call it the Red Green Alliance. The Green, green, the green is Islamic uh, radicals, uh, red, the left, and the white, the anti-Semitic, the anti-Semitic white. So you, you, you ask yourself who these people defend. For example, they defend Hamas. Hamas. Hamas, how they treat people, it's, it's, a, it's one of the, of the cruelest theocracy, Islamic theocracy they can think of. And how they treat women, how they treat um, uh, homosexuals. And suddenly the liberal left defends that. So this is something that I think is quite strange. Uh, I, sometimes I don't understand that because I feel I speak to reasonable people. Turns out they are not reasonable at all. And for them, Israel's problem is that it's okay to criticize Israeli government policy, I do it myself. The problem is when you begin to question Israel's right to exist, when you, when you demonize Israel, when you say that the Palestinians cannot do wrong and Israel cannot do right, then I'm quite disturbed about it. So yes, I think we have, Israel has a huge problem with the radical left, especially in the United States. But I think that this is almost a lost case. I don't debate them anymore because they don't listen. They, you know, we have facts. You are supposed to speak to intellectuals and, and professors who, who know what facts are. They don't, they don't listen. They don't want to listen. They want to stick to their highly unfounded radical biased notions of, of political realities and if you don't if you if you have audience that don't does not want to listen how you can influence the opinions of those audiences next question yes. I'm, okay Shando. My name is Shandor Kerekes. Have you heard that British universities refuse Israeli scholars too? British universities? British universities, yes. Very interesting, isn't it? Very interesting, isn't it? How interesting. Um, at the establishment of, the, the time of establishment of Israel in 1947, there was a Palestinian state established at the same time, wasn't there? It was called Jordan and the West Bank was part of it. However, the Arabs refused to accept this partition and ever since the conflict in is in existence. Uh, despite the fact that most of the Jews purchased for money the land that they intended to use. Um, I am I'm reminded of uh, your presentation, sir, of uh, Alexander Humboldt, who said that he is in very much in favor of Jews in wholesale, he just can't stand them in retail. It's the same thing with the anti-Israel, uh, anti, 
anti-Zionism movement disguised as anti-Zionism, whereas it is just nothing more than uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, my question, because I do have one actually, is what prevents Israel from imposing a democratic... Oh, I have a suspicion what it is, but uh, um, since Prime Minister Netanyahu is whittling away the credentials, the democratic credentials of Israel, it is becoming more and more difficult. But it is still not impossible that Israel could impose a democratic regime for the Palestinians, setting strict guidelines, election in one year or two, uh, whoever does not like it can lump it, and establishing a Palestinian state at the Israelis' expense, which they are already paying, he said, because Israel is already keeping alive all those in the West Bank, uh, services in uh, ambulance services and veterinary services and so on. So Israel is already paying the price. So it would be very little extra to establish a Palestinian state and from then on uh, just peaceful coexistence whether they like it or not, so to speak. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, we have history here, I uh, an historical observation and some and a question about the present. So about history, the point is very interesting. Um, this is, um, you know, the UN petition resolution for November 1947 didn't speak about the Palestinian state. The resolution says the establishment of a Jewish and an Arab state. Not a Palestinian state. The Palestine, this is why we, we talk about the Battle Declaration, right? So what the British did is contradiction in terms. Because on the one hand, they issued a historical recognition of Jewish rights in, in Israel, land of Israel. And on the other hand, called it Palestine. I don't know if you know where Palestine comes from. The word Palestine comes, uh, was, was invented by the Romans after the destruction of the Second Temple in order to erase any connection between the Jews and the land. Now, I was born in, 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 in Israel. So first of all, it's quite interesting because in Arabic and English, when the British received, took over the you know, First World War, and took that, that territory, it was Palestine in English and Arabic, it was Palestine in the land of Israel in Hebrew. So even, even, the, even the name of, of the territory was different depending on the language. I was born before 1948. I was a Palestinian. Everybody in Israel and in this area was a Palestinian. I was a Palestinian Jew. I have a birth certificate which says that my nationality is a Palestinian Jew. And there were Palestinian Arabs. 1948, Israel was established. So we became Israelis, and they remained Palestinian Arabs. Now, why am I saying all of that? Because I happen to believe, based on historical research, that the Palestinian people would not have, would not have emerged I did not for the Palestinian I did, I did not for the Zionist movement. There's history of my own family, which is also quite interesting. My mother's side. So, so yes, 1922, Britain got the mandate over what is today. Israel, West Bank, and Jordan. Then it wanted to reward Sheikh Hassan of Mecca for the absence of his participation on the side of the British in the First World War. He promised to participate. He never participated. Nonetheless, Britain gave his sons, Jordan, and also Iraq, two kingdoms. So Jordan was like an artificial entity. Palestine, Palestinian, was even more artificial entity. I'm not denying that today there is a Palestinian people. But one has to understand where it comes from. When the Palestinian narrative, well, we have been there for centuries, and you, you create the impression that Palestine existed as an independent Arab state, 
The Jews came and took over the country. Never happened. Now, briefly, just a second question, which is, well, you know, we can spend all the whole, whole, whole day. Uh, so the second, the second issue is about imposing democracy. I don't believe that, that democracy can be imposed. And the United States learned that lesson in Iraq. I had a professor uh, at Harvard University. His name was John Montgomery. What is unique about him is that he was the governor the military governor of Tokyo. And he wrote a book called Forced to be Free. And this book is about Japan and Germany. <coughs> but quite interestingly, I taught, I, I was invited to teach at Harvard after 9-11. And I met him. And he told me, wow, uh, my book, Forced to be Free, now every government official and the Bush administration wants the book. The book is out of print. I have only one copy left of the book. And, and the Bush administration really thought they could force democracy on Iraq as a model for other, other Middle Eastern countries. This is why I think the, the US motivation to go into Iraq is not well understood. And, and but I don't have the book anymore. Uh, and obviously, my response to him was, let's discuss it. There were huge differences between Germany and Japan, on the one hand, and Iraq on the other hand. I believe that democracy should come from the people themselves. This is why the Arab Spring was a forced notion. But the people were in favor of removing an autocracy, but didn't have any idea about, about democracy. And they really did not fight for democracy. So I think that it's too much for, for any country to try to impose a system of government on another country. But I think that an opportunity was missed when the Palestinian Authority was established. Because at that time, all kinds of conditions could have been set. But the United States and also the Israeli government couldn't care. They wanted a strong Palestinian leader like Yasser Arafat. Because they thought that only a dictator of his nature can really achieve peace. And I happen to believe that this is true. That I don't, that, you know, Mahmoud Abbas today. He received a, a proposal from Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister Orban in 2008, which was the best proposal the Palestinians would ever have gotten, even with the vision of Jerusalem. And he said, I'll give you an answer. He came back and he said, this is an excellent proposal. We, we would not be able to get any, any better. And we should do it. And then his people told him, if you sign this agreement, you are dead and meant to tomorrow. So there was an opportunity of sort to lay conditions for the establishment of parts in the state because this is dependent on Israel. This is dependent on Israel. But it was missed because of the rationale that I have just provided to you. And I'm not so sure that even if the, these conditions were set, that suddenly the Palestinians would have become a democratic country. I have doubts if this, you know, I don't see a democracy in Gaza or in the West Bank for the next generation or so. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to come back on the question about democracy at the point of a gun? That's one sentence uh, on experience from, uh, from uh, Palestine. Actually, the name is very interesting because when the next generation of my mother came back from Auschwitz and from the other camps, they emigrated to Palestine. They said they are going to Palestine. And then in the early 90s, my mother, when she was talking about the relatives in Israel, said that they they went to Palestine in the 1980s. So it's, it's just the uh, assessment of what, what you said is, is really very true. Uh, my problem is that democracy uh, is really free of fair elections, does not guarantee that the elections uh, 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 produce a democratic government. It started with Adolf Hitler and then from Israel, from the Palestinian authority, we know the election of Hamas, 
if there will be free elections today in, in the Palestinian Authority, they would have come as, as a British ruler, uh, and that would be the end of the, of the, uh, uh, the democratic state if ever, uh, if ever established. I, think, I don't think it's, uh, this exists. Uh, my, I, I, I compare with my students who are much younger than those present in this room that, that when you become old, you have to, to learn to live with certain problems. You have to make a treatise, you have to learn to live with it. Uh, because it will never go away. If you don't, uh, if you are not happy treating your syndromes, you will suffer. If you, and if you want to, to ignore the syndromes and you want to recover, because you will not recover and uh, you, you will have a lot of pain. So you have to concentrate on the syndromes. I think for the time being, uh, I agree with one generation. generation. Uh, it won't be democracy. Palestine, what it means. It doesn't mean that we should not try to make steps towards it. The most important thing today, I think, is, is the trend. Is the trend going against democracy, as it has been going for the, for the last decade in Palestine, or is it going towards democracy? And I think that's what we, we need to find out how to do. A quick follow-up to that. I mean, doesn't it follow from that that if you're not, in a sense, aiming for democracy in, the, in those circumstances, that what you can aim for is better behaviour by the governments that exist there, and and the, and that's not something we, we saw, is it, in the charts um, of, of the, the grants that European countries give to Israel and Palestine? Yeah, yeah. No, good. Good. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to take a few more questions. The gentleman here. Well, I'd just like to go back to the, to the comment you made about uh, maybe thinking about something else besides the Holocaust for justifying Israel. And, uh, you know, without, without the Holocaust, there would have been no Israel. There wouldn't have been enough uh, immigrants to go there. If you look at the immigration into the mandate days in the 1920s before Hitler. Uh, you know, people weren't queuing up to go there. It's uh, hot, it's dry, there was no air conditioning, and so on. And, uh, but you know, things have moved on. And uh, since then we've seen that the military balance has changed. Israel is also an economic power. Uh, back, uh, I went there in 1969 the first time. I was also in Hungary visiting that year. There wasn't much difference between them. They looked like, in terms of standard of living, the people, the, uh, the, there was an efficient uh, army and air force, of course, but in terms of living standards, uh, you couldn't see that much. Uh, but it's a socialist country, by the way, and uh, there was no foreign investment to speak of. Uh, and then a lot of things changed from then on, and today the military balance is different. Uh, there is no, no existential threat to Israel anymore except maybe Iran if it becomes nuclear. Um, so just in view of these things, uh, we're talking about the Palestinians, which is a sideshow. Uh, there is a big Middle Eastern policy. Israel is, play, is, is a regional power. It has important engagements. And meanwhile, we have a Palestinian terrorism, Palestinian independence, and so on and so forth. Um, can we move on? I mean, do you think it's, it's realistic for Either, either the Israelis or for the uh, United States or the EU to just say, well, yes, this is the situation and there, there is low-grade terrorism uh, going on in Israel. Can they live with that on both sides? And then just leave them alone. Instead of trying to bring peace, which is you know, very visual, can we just say, fine, uh, you get on with your lives, we get on with ours, and uh, maybe something will emerge when the two people get tired of killing each other. Uh, because I don't see a solution, frankly. I think there's an easy answer uh, to your questions. Uh, my answer is yes, this is what should be done. Because uh, two things. First, external interference and interventions in, in negotiations have been always counterproductive at the first stage. The only I mean, two or three peace initiatives that occurred uh, in the Middle East, Israel and Egypt, and Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization, to some extent also, uh, and so on, also um, uh, Israel and Jordan, came from the area itself. 
And I can tell you, because I did myself research on it, President Sadat came to Jerusalem in defiance of the American Carter's, President Carter, plan to push for a comprehensive Middle Eastern peace through a conference in Geneva with the Russians, with the Soviets. This is what really infuriated Sadat, who said, I got the Soviets out of Egypt, and Carter is trying to bring them back to the window. I am just, I'm just quoting him. So they decided, I can't trust the United States anymore. Carter is an idiot. He doesn't understand anything about the Middle East. So I'm going to take my initial step. And also, and also, so Carter then, after that, Carter played a, 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 a significant role uh, in concluding the agreement, not, not at the beginning. So, and this is the same thing, exactly the same thing happened uh, with the Oslo, so-called Oslo peace process. This process failed, but because of, 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 of other circumstances, unlike the Egyptian-Israeli peace process, but, so what I'm saying is, that given the historical record, and also some negotiation common sense, the less external intervention you have, the better are the chances for negotiations. And this is especially true for the Palestinians because they have never been willing to uh, make the concessions needed to achieve peace. The maximum that Israel could give them did not meet the minimum that they required. This is like a matrix of negotiations. And therefore, the internal interventions, or say, of the European Union and the Obama administration were completely counterproductive, not helpful. And I think that if the sides were left for themselves, there would have been better chance to reach some kind of conflict resolution. I don't use the word peace, conflict resolution, some kind of an end to the conflict. Thank you very much. Um, another question? A uh, gentleman here. Well, we have three questions. I'm going to take those three questions. And then I think we're getting close to our uh, time limit, aren't we? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the uh, gentleman here. Uh, regarding, I just would like to comment and also ask uh, both of the, uh, of, of the lecturers uh, about the segmentation of the message of the, of the right uh, of existence of Israel. Because if I, if I just consider it, you know that uh, in the Western democracies, especially the, uh, the, the Christian, conservative Christian rights, the mainstream rights, I would say, and especially the, the, uh, the evangelical and, and Pentecostal Christians in the United States, and also in Europe, they don't have any problem because they, f they see Israel as a fulfillment of the prophecies of the Bible. So there is no question. But the other, the other two uh, uh, groups, you know, the mainstream uh, left uh, and a part of the national right movement uh, or right political blocs, th that, that is what, what, which is not clear to me, what is the message for them, you know, in order to, you know, to, uh, to, to prove the, the rights of existence. Because I think that the, the question uh, uh, which was raised uh, by Mr. Jormat is absolutely... Uh, relevant and realistic that, that, you know, these kind of messages should be targeted and segmented to different political blocs. Uh, now, and I think that the, this is the same because as much as I understand, Mr. Jormat is coming from the, I would say, the mainstream left. Or, well, at least, you know, some connections with the Socialist Party earlier, but, but uh, as, okay, and then independent intellectual, okay, let, let, let's just respect. Uh, his definition, but I think that he's got that kind of understanding of that that political uh, uh, right. So how would you describe, you know, because this is really a difficult intellectual question, you know, because the message cannot be the same for, for these three uh, political blocs in the Western uh, democracies. They don't even talk to each other in the same language, especially not in the States, you know, if you, if, if you understand. So... Thank you. Perhaps I can just ask the three speakers. I'm going to take the questions separately, um, but perhaps I can ask both speakers to give fairly brisk answers, and then we'll, we'll finish. Well, I, I think it, I don't know the answer, actually. I, first of all, because 
uh, because it's very complicated. Secondly, because it would require two more hours, I think, at least to uh, to answer your your questions. All I have suggested is that that we uh, we should seriously think about uh, how to how to do, we should recognize the problem. We should admit the problem because many of the Jews and and the Israeli elite is in denial of this problem. They still think that uh, that this problem doesn't exist. Uh, I think first we should convince ourselves. Uh, that we have a problem and then try to, to find a, uh, an answer that is acceptable uh, for us and then uh, try to differentiate uh, regarding the, uh, the audience. And I just want to say I'm not coming from any mainstream, whatever, mainstream professionals, if I may, or intellectuals. Okay. You're speaking for yourself, yes. Uh, I resist uh, this issue of the need to justify your right to exist. Uh, I think about it as an Israeli in theory. Uh, but I understand, I understand your reason behind it. Uh, but I think that think Israel and its supporters in the United States and Europe have ignored this challenge a long time ago. And it has been building up. And I, uh, what I think uh, we should do is simply, is simply, I don't want to answer this question about the right to exist, but I'm ready to provide uh, information and facts. This is, this is our duty or our mission, so that people will not dare to raise that issue again. That's, that's the whole idea. So in, from my perspective, there's only one message, and regardless, regardless who the answer is. I speak to evangelicals and I speak also to the Methodists. There, there are also churches which, by the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, distorted narrative as well. And some that was the World Council of Churches, for example. So we, we, I wanted to speak that. They didn't want to hear me. This is what I said earlier. Uh, they didn't want to hear me because somebody uh, they took a videotape of what, I, what I've said. And what I've said today is just a fraction what I'm always, what I'm lecturing about Israeli-Palestinian historical relations. So they didn't allow me to speak to them. I said, don't you want to hear the other side? No, they don't want to hear the other side. So, so you have a message, but you don't have audience. That, that's, that, that's, that is the real problem. Mm -hmm. Not the message, but an audience that is sufficiently open to hear what the other side has to say. But um, so, so I think that the, the, the approach is first of all you have to you have to uh, condemn you have to criticize those who don't want to listen to you. This is number one, and I think this should be done across the board. Uh, if you if you if people want to shut you up in British and, and, and American universities, you have to find that, and you, you should not allow that uh, allow that to happen. And I think my problem I, I talk to presidents of American university. You know, there's something called Israel Apartheid Week. A whole week in March in American universities. I'm not talking about the whole false analogy, which I'm prepared to refute. So I talked to the president of, of uh, Stanford University. He said, can you show me one single issue in the world you have a whole week on? One single issue. One day. Okay. Two days. A whole week? Every year. Every year. This is, this is, this is crazy. <laughs> so I blame presidents of American universities they rely on that. And the way to push them is by money. Because donors, you, you, you have to educate donors and tell donors, look, this is what you want to see on American campuses? Today's Israel, tomorrow something else. This American academic community, and then British as well, and in Europe as well, they are violating every principle of academic freedom. Every principle. I'm not speaking, I'm not speaking yet, I'm not speaking yet about what is happening in the classroom. Middle Eastern departments were taken over, completely were taken over. Graduates of these departments go to work with the American government, and then you understand how stupid they are and ignorant they are, and they give the kind of advice to someone like Obama who would make it the basic of his policy, which with a disastrous uh, results. We have about three minutes. 
uh, Mr. Giamatti has to leave uh, 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 at five o'clock, no later. I'm going to ask Janet very quickly and the gentleman in the front row very quickly to give okay. quick answers, to quick questions, yes. followed by quick Janet answers. Janet Karakesh, um, this has to do with the Israeli right to exist or not to exist. So if Israel, and finding reasons that people can agree with and say, oh, so Israel should exist. So my question would be, if Israel should become undemocratic one day, should not be a key to European security, and not make technical contributions anymore in the world, would its right to exist be forfeit? Because there are no longer justifications and benefits for it to exist. And very quick question um, for the first speaker, which is, why not cancel the nuclear deal with, with Iran? A short and, co and uh, concrete question. Uh, Iran wants uh, military uh, bases, uh, permanent military bases in Syria. And there are reports according to which uh, they have already established one. What can do Israel against it? Because it's dangerous for it. Uh, as I say, perhaps you could just answer and run. <laughs> Thank you very much for your understanding. I'm sorry, but that's the wrong question. Your question would be the right question if we would agree that Israel rights to exist, uh, that it, it is legitimate to, uh, to question Israel's rights to exist, and then we would have to, to explain it and to answer it and to argue it, even if, if, if Israel would not be democratic and would not do all the things that, that we have mentioned. But as we do not think that, uh, we do not think that we need to argue Israel's rights to exist. What we do think is that we have to convince those people who, who don't think uh, that Israel has a right to exist. Therefore, we need to use these arguments, not because we don't believe it, but because we should, uh, should, should be able to convince the others. And I think this is very essential for us. And that's what I'm saying, that if we remain in the state of denial that we don't need to explain it, then we will lose more and more of the generations. Now we lose the teenagers and the 20 ages or whatever, and then we, we will lose the uh, uh, the rest, and then uh, politics is going in a bad direction in Western Europe, and it will go uh, worse and worse if we if we don't take up uh, this challenge. I think this is this is what, and that's why I said that we need to discuss it with ourselves first, come to a conclusion for ourselves, and then go out and convince the the others as much as we can. Of course, we will never be able to convince the Nazis, but we don't need to, to, to convince them. I mean, if they would be the only ones who won't believe it, fine, I would like to see that happen. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have to, to run at five o'clock, uh, but I, I hope to see you again at some point. Yes. Well, thank you very much, and, and that's the same for us, but thank you very much. Professor, you have the last word. Okay, so, so two questions about Iran. Why not the Council to deal? Because um, in order to be effective against Iran, you have to build the coalitions. Uh, Iran was forced into negotiations, did want negotiations, was forced into negotiations because of the sanctions. The sanctions were applied by many countries, by a coalition of countries. <coughs> Uh, primarily uh, Europe and the United States. Now Europe wants to keep the agreement. The United States wants, and Israel wants to cancel it, and also most of the Arab Sunni world. I was really angry when I heard <coughs> President Obama say, only Israel and Netanyahu oppose the Iran nuclear deal. He said that, and he lied. He didn't tell the truth. The truth was that all the Arab Sunni states were also against the deal. This is what he said. Now I think that it would be, so I think that there is, I, I am against the cancellation of the deal simply because I think that there should be better ways to deal with the uh, negative ramifications of the deal and the key for this is international cooperation and I, and I, I, I made a, a lecture about it a few months ago and I said that this is the, what needs to be done is to deal with the issues left out by the deal, such as missiles and, and manipulations and interventions in parts of the Middle East, 
Here you can have a coalition of Arab Sunni states and Israel and other kind of Turkey, the United States, and Europe. And Mother Macron has just proven the wisdom of that approach. In addition, I think what needs to be done also is to say, okay, the deal postponed nuclearization for 10 years. Two years have already passed. Uh, there is uh, what is known as the sunset clause, which means after 10 years, Iran, 10 to 15, 10 to 12 years, Iran will be allowed to acquire nuclear weapons. The deal is just for 10 to 12 years. So I think what should be said is, and I think the United States with Europe can, can unite on that. Let's discuss now, half a year from now, the post-deal period. So I think there's a better chance to limit the damages of the, of, of, of the deal by taking this approach. And the second question, yes, Iran, Iran wants to, to occupy Syria. That's, Iran wants to occupy Syria. So they want to build a military, military bases there. Uh, Israel told uh, Putin, Russia, that this is not going to happen, and if necessary, Israel will use force to prevent that from happening. So Israel attacked in recent weeks. Uh, the Iran is it's trying to challenge Israel. They were, they were building two missile factories in Syria. Both of them were destroyed. So I think this is this is a red line, and I think that if they, you know, they were they, they are trying to build a camp. Now, I think that if they will try to uh, bring soldiers into this camp, it will have to be destroyed. So if you ask how to do it, only through force and deterrence. I don't I don't see any way that you can persuade the Ayatollahs in Iran not to do something by diplomacy and nice negotiation. Thank you very much for coming and for listening. Thank you very much. For